This is Heart Rhythm TV, and I'm Dan Aliash here with breaking news out of the ACC 23 scientific sessions. We've watched the data coming out with PFA with much anticipation, and we will present the results of the Pulse AF pivotal trial. And for that reason, I am joined today by Dr. Atul Verma of McGill University. Welcome. Thank you so much, Daniel. So um, the Pulse AF pivotal trial. Uh, one-year data, uh, follow-up data, a non-randomized global prospective single-arm balanced trial uh, enrolling 300 patients, 150 patients in the paroxysmal arm and 150 in the persistent arm. Congratulations on a great study. And I'll take us to our first slide here. Tell us a little bit about the study you performed and what you found. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, the, as you pointed out, there's been a lot of uh, anticipation about pulse field ablation over the last few years. A lot of preliminary first in human studies, but this was uh, the first really rigorously conducted global study. Lots of operators, 67 operators in many countries. 41 centers. So uh, really need to thank all of them. Uh, in terms of the primary efficacy outcome, uh, we sort of divide the primary eff efficacy outcome was a composite. So you could fail in a variety of different ways. Obviously, if you had an atrial arrhythmia recurrence greater than 30 seconds, if you had a repeat ablation, if you had a cardioversion, but also if the antiarrhythmic changed from the pre-antiarrhythmic drugs, if there were any escalations in dose, if you used amio during the blanking period, these were all modes of failure. Now, what we found is that in the paroxysmal group, the freedom from, uh, from such a composite endpoint was 66.2% in the paroxysmal patient and 55.1% in the uh, persistent population. Now, for monitoring, just to add, we not only had Holter monitoring, but we also had weekly TTM transmissions. Uh, we had over 11,000 transmissions in these two cohorts of patients, and as well whenever they were symptomatic. So this was really rigorously monitored. If we use just freedom from atrial arrhythmia, uh, which is the usual endpoint that most of these trials Rita was nearly 70% in the paroxysmal group and 62% in the persistent group. And then freedom from any symptomatic atrial arrhythmia was about 80% in both groups. Wonderful. Now, um, you know, following the response to this trial, and I think that first off, you know, early data, early experience, comparable outcomes to prior trials with traditional ablation techniques. Um, I think many are hoping for, you know, the EP community has gone through the range of emotions with regards to this, these data. Um, and I would say, so I, my first question for you is, um, why choose the traditional 30 second um, freedom from AF versus looking at a rhythm of birth? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, um, it's a little unfortunate that as a community, we're stuck with this freedom from atrial arrhythmia greater than 30 seconds. It was put in our consensus statement a long time ago, and it's never really been shaken. Um, having said that, we had so much TTM data, Dan, that we are actually going to do another analysis based on burden. And we actually have that data. We've uh, submitted it to Heart Rhythm as a potential late breaker. Uh, we don't know if it will get accepted or not, but I'm hoping that we'll be able to present that data to you soon. Wonderful. Um, the other question I have for you with regards to um, PFA, uh, Hiroshi Nakagawa last year at Heart Rhythm presented data, uh, animal data, with regards to the importance of contact force for lesion size and durability. Uh, what is your perspective on the importance of contact force with the PFA technology? 
Yeah, you know, I think contact is clearly very important. You have to be touching the tissue. Uh, we did a study uh, published not too long ago showing that if you start to get as much as two millimeters away from the tissue, you still create a lesion, but it's far from optimal. And once it's four millimeters away, you're not really creating any lesion at all. So contact is important. I am a little less sure about the need for contact force because here we're delivering an electrical field. We are not delivering, you know, a thermal based energy. And so I think the jury is still out whether you need force, but I think everyone agrees that you need contact. Thank you. So, you know, I actually found these data to be just so uh, incredible. Uh, your primary safety endpoint summary. So, and, you know, for the viewers, you know, you, the, the operators were represented in nine countries, 67 operators, 61 who had never, who did not participate in the original pilot, didn't have familiarity with the system. And you're reporting a 0.7%, um, you know, safety endpoint um, outcome. Now, that is incredible. I mean, I think that we were praising Jonathan uh, Sue's paper recently out of the NCDR for a 0.9% uh, major complication rate in our current um, data registry. These data you're reporting lower. So talk to me a little bit about the safety endpoint and also, uh, you know, having these many operators with, with, with this level of familiarity with the device. Yeah, I think we were, uh, you know, I'm really proud of all of the investigators for having done such a wonderful job. Uh, you're absolutely right. Most of the operators had no prior experience with this catheter. And the only experience they got was being allowed to have one roll-in patient, which is really not that much. And yet, in spite of that, you see that we had a zero... 7% complication rate in the two arms. Uh, there were no phrenic nerve palsies. There was no pulmonary vein stenosis. There were no esophageal issues, even indirect, like obviously fistulas are very rare, but there was no uh, dysmotility or gastroparesis or other indirect esophageal. So this is really very good data, and it speaks to the the safety of this technology, the safety of this particular system, and the ease of use of the system. Uh, the fact that, you know, pretty inexperienced, they were all experienced bl ablators, but people with very limited experience with this system were able to come right out of the gate and get this low of a complication rate. It's one of the lowest complication rates ever reported in a global AF ablation trial. Wow. So uh, moving out a bit to nuts and bolts, um, procedural characteristics here. Couldn't help but notice, you know, you're looking at roughly a 65 minute left atrial dwell time, 55 to 70 minute um, fluoroscopy time, 26 to 29 minutes, total pulsed energy of 25 seconds, and then 48 or 57 applications per patient, depending on whether you're a paroxysmal or persistent. For people who are not familiar with the PFA system, walk us through kind of what these data procedurally mean. And if you could also comment on over time as people perform more procedures, did these data change or do we not know? Yeah, these are great questions. So first of all, our skin-to-skin -skin procedural time is not a great time because that includes from first sheath in to last sheath out. So for example, for me, where the sheets are recovery room. That also includes the transfer time for the patient back to the recovery room, the nurses pulling the sheets. So this time is not a very good time. The dwell time on the other hand, the left atrial dwell time was first time from first to last ablation. It also included a mandated 20 minute waiting period. And it also included any post ablation mapping if people wanted to do a voltage map afterwards. So even if you, you know, throw in the mapping time, 
if you subtract the 20 minute waiting period, you're talking about procedure times that are about 40 minutes, 50 minutes. And that is very, very fast. Uh, and for, you know, what was essentially the first time experience for a lot of these operators. Um, the fluoroscopy time was a little bit on the long side because this system is not fully integrated with mapping yet. Uh, although there, there were a lot of operators who opted to use mapping, but not everybody did. Um, the pulse field ablation energy of only 25 or 29 seconds shows quickly you can deliver this energy. You know, each delivery is a fraction of a second. So when we look at the number of applications, yeah, it looks large, 48 or 57, but each of these applications takes a few milliseconds. So um, another thing is when you deliver pulse field ablation, the electrograms, bipolar electrograms go away pretty much right away. And so you can't use those anymore as a full guidance of when you're done. What we learned in the pilot study is that rep repetitive applications are key. And so on average, we recommended during the training at least eight applications per pulmonary vein for a minimum of 32 applications per patient. I think the reason why you saw more applications in the persistent arm is because I think people went a more on the posterior wall and were sort of doing wider antral PVIs in the persistent population rather than the paroxysmals. Can I ask you a, a procedural question in, in a future direction? Now you talk a little bit about the importance of tissue contact, maybe not force, but contact. You know, I see the fluoro times, I hear about, you know, map integration, but I can't help but ask the question about intracardiac echo for verifying tissue contact. Um, to what degree is that being used and uh, to what degree is it useful? Yeah, so, uh, you know, most of the U.S. centers, if not all of them, as well as the Canadian centers, were using intracardiac echo. But a lot of the sites outside, like the European sites, the Japanese sites, were not necessarily using any intracardiac echo. So there was some variation in practice. Uh, personally, I did mapping, but I used intracardiac echo to assess contact and to really see where the catheter was. And it's very easy to visualize on ice. Uh, but many, many of the centers participating in this study did not use ice at all. And I think that has created some of the variation in the fluoroscopy time. Wonderful. So, you know, final question for you. Um, we're all excited about this technology. We, you know, many of us believe it will be transformative uh, for electrophysiology. What do you see as the future direction for PFA? I think the future, you know, every few years we hear about the latest and greatest toy in electrophysiology and then, you know, it never really pans out the way we thought. Uh, in this case, I think PFA is is a real thing. I think it is going to transform. I think it is going to become a, an energy source for AF ablation in the next few years. Uh, I think at the end of the day, if the success rates are just as good or at least as good as RF and cryo, but the technology is safer and much faster, then it'll win. And uh, I think in the future, what we can see, this is generation one of PFA technology compared to 25 years of cryo and F. So this technology is only going to get better over time. And I think we are going to eventually see those success rates get even better. But, uh, you know, this is just hot out of the gate, you know, with the first generation system. I think that's pretty good. Absolutely. I think the future is bright and future iterations will, will bring us closer to, you know, to really realizing the full potential of this technology. Um, well, congratulations on a great study um, and congratulations to the organizers of ACC 23. Um, thank you for joining me at Tool, And uh, thank you for tuning in to Heart Ridden TV. <laughs>